Hello. Uh, welcome to the next episode of this series on learning and behavior. And uh, what we're going to talk about today is kind of a conceptual issue of uh, what do you do? How do you interpret an experiment uh, where you uh, design a conditioning procedure and you carry it out and you don't see a conditioned response? What does that mean? Does that mean that your experiment was a failure? Well, <laughs> I'm here to tell you good news, not necessarily. Your experiment might have been perfectly fine. Uh, but what gets us to uh, reject experiments that don't show conditioned responses uh, has a long history that goes back to uh, this diagram that's shown in the next slide. Uh, which is a diagram that you all have probably seen, or if not this exact one, something like it, uh, when you first learned about Pavlovian conditioning. And uh, what this diagram uh, illustrates is uh, the top row is the status of the Pavlov's dog before the introduction of a training procedure. The dog salivates in response to uh, uh, food in a bowl. Not big, uh, uh, you know, not big news there. Uh, if you ring a bell, he doesn't salivate. And then you do a conditioning procedure as shown on the bottom uh, uh, left hand side where the bell is paired with the food. And then you test the dog uh, after a number of trials, ring the bell and lo and behold, it didn't previously salivate, but now it does. And so that illustrates Pavlovian conditioning. Well, as I mentioned, this diagram is something like it is uh, used ubiquitously everywhere to uh, introduce students to Pavlovian conditioning. And I got to thinking about this, uh, looking at this diagram a little bit more closely, and, and uh, it turns out there are a lot of problems with it. And so if you look at the next slide, uh, it, uh, <laughs> it shows uh, an article that I decided to write about this which asks the question what's wrong with this picture <laughs> and the answer is just about everything <laughs> and i was real pleased that uh, the observer which is a uh, publication of the association for psychological science uh, was good enough to publish this article in their uh, july august uh, issue in uh, 2021 so what's wrong with this picture? Well, one of the things that's wrong with this picture is that it implies that the experiment is a failure if you don't see a conditioned response. And uh, I'm uh, gonna show you some data to suggest that maybe we shouldn't think about it that way. So the next slide uh, illustrates uh, the basic apparatus that uh, was used by uh, Melissa Burns Casado uh, to study sign tracking and goal tracking in a sexual behavior system. Uh, and uh, it's work that was done a couple of years ago in my laboratory. And uh, we do sexual conditioning using Japanese quail. I've talked about this in other videos. Uh, male bird is housed in a, a large area that's four feet on a side. Female is housed on a, in a side compartment uh, with a barrier. Uh, in this particular experiment, condition stimulus uh, was presented uh, against the right wall uh, opposite where the female was released. And after pre presentation of the CS, the female was allowed out and uh, the male and female had fun. So that's the basic experiment. And in this situation, uh, there are two things that you could measure. You could measure all kinds of things. but. In this particular experiment, uh, Dr. Burns Casado elected to uh, measure two things. One is whether the male approached the conditioned stimulus, which would be sign tracking. And in doing so, he would be going away from the door where the female was going to be released. Uh, so sign tracking was one, re one possible response. And the other possible response was goal tracking, that is, when the condition stimulus is presented, uh, does the male go to the door where the female is going to show up? Now the next slide shows you the results of the experiment, but before we talk about the results, I want to talk about uh, different experimental conditions that were compared in this experiment. Uh, 
And these different experimental conditions uh, varied uh, the uh, uh, CT ratio, <laughs> which is kind of a technical thing. Uh, but C refers to the cycle time or the intertrial interval. And T refers to the duration of the CS. And you can uh, vary both of these factors and setting up different CT ratios. And in this case, it ranged from 1.5 uh, to 180. Now let's look at the results and let's look uh, first at the data for sign tracking. Uh, the sign tracking data are the, the dark uh, filled circles. And uh, what you see is that with a really low CT ratio, they're not doing any sign tracking. So you're not seeing any condition behavior there. Now, as you increase the CT ratio, you get more and more condition behavior and get lots of condition behavior uh, with a very high CT ratio. And these are these kinds of data have been found uh, in lots of other situations as well, all kinds of Pavlovian situations. And in fact, they're the basis of a major theory of uh, Pavlovian conditioning known as uh, rate expectancy theory, which uh, uh, predicts, uh, as these sign tracking data indicate, that uh, you get conditioning only at high CT ratios. So let's go back to the question of what if you don't get a conditioned response? Well, you don't get a conditioned response if you just measure sign tracking. You don't see a conditioned response at the low CT ratios. And uh, rate expectancy theory kind of is happy with that. And that's the end of the story as far as they're concerned. One, the end of the story for us, because we also measured goal tracking. And uh, what you see is that the low CT ratios pr provide uh, result in substantial levels of goal tracking uh, and goal tracking decreases as the CT ratio increase. So if you don't see a condition response, it could, could be because you're not measuring the right thing. And if you measured other types of behaviors, you could get a pattern of results that is entirely contrary to your theory. And in this case, the rate expectancy theory. So that's uh, one reason why you should not be too depressed <laughs> if you don't see a CR. What's another reason? It's illustrated in the next slide, uh, which uh, deals with uh, context conditioning, where you don't have a discrete stimulus, so like a light or a tone or something, but the entire environment is, is the cue which in this case tell, uh, indicated that the male would get access to a female, okay? So being in this particular place uh, signaled access to a female. And we only did one conditioning trial. And if you do one, this is called a context conditioning experiment as done by Stuart Hilliard. Uh, if you do a context conditioning experiment and only do one trial and you look to see how to, subject response to being in that place you can't see anything it doesn't look like anything happens but if you introduce a probe stimulus particularly a probe stimulus like this that has very limited female features uh, and the, what you find is that in this particular conditioned context the subjects run over there and show a lot of interest in this probe stimulus. So you get a strong approach responses to the probe if the context was paired with uh, sexual reinforcement and not if the context was not paired. So in this case, the condition stimulus is not eliciting a response, it's modulating the reactivity to the probe stimulus. And a lot of Pavlovian conditioning is of that sort where the elicited the impact of this conditioned stimulus is not a discrete CR. It's not like salivating to the bell. Uh, in Pavlov situation, ringing the bell probably made the dog salivate more when the food arrived. So it modulates responses to other cues. And those other cues could be unconditioned stimuli. And the next slide uh, makes essentially that point. 
that uh, if you're looking for modulatory effects of conditioned stimuli, uh, you're, oh, you can, of course, present uh, these kinds of uh, fairly impoverished uh, cues that have very little in inherent interest, but they have a little bit of inherent interest. Or you can present the oh, female itself. And you can ask the question, is uh, presenting the conditioned stimulus, is that uh, going to alter how the male interacts with the female, and uh, it turns out the answer is yes, and uh, and uh, and there are huge effects. Uh, the next slide uh, lists uh, some of these, uh, and this is in uh, uh, particularly important in the context of conditioning of females. Anyway, here we're looking at uh, responses to a sexual partner. And uh, some of these responses are male responses, some are female responses. There's decreased la latency uh, to copulate. There's increase in release of sperm. There's increase in female receptivity. There's increased efficiency of copulation, and so on and so forth. So uh, it turns out that uh, often the most uh, uh, sensitive and important consequence of conditioning is not the response that the CS elicits, but how the presentation of the conditioned stimulus changes how you interact with the unconditioned stimulus. We may look at the next slide. Uh, this uh, illustrates some of the reasons why this is important. In general, what we're talking about here are condition modifications of the unconditioned response, how the CS modulates responses to the US. And uh, uh, as I've noted, the sexual CS facilitates responses to unconditioned stimuli presented by a sexual partner, and there are a wide range of these. And these are really important. And the reason that they're important is that Conditioned responses to a CS never got anybody pregnant or fertilized the gamete. That is, from a biological standpoint, responding to the CS is not the critical thing. The critical thing is to uh, become more efficient and effective in uh, your interactions with the unconditioned stimulus. And, these kinds of effects, these condition modifications of the unconditioned response have been uh, demonstrated in a wide uh, variety of contexts. You see them in fear conditioning and in appetitive conditioning. You see them in, in conditioning with various drugs and so forth and so on. We may look at the next slide. So the conclusion is <laughs> no CR, no problem. Condition may be evident in responses you didn't measure. They produce, may produce modulatory effects instead of activating responding directly. And uh, they may alter how you respond to the US. There are other possible things going on that we haven't had a time to talk about. The, uh, it may be that the experiment created problems in retrieval uh, of, uh, of memories in the face of perfectly good learning. So the absence of a CR may be a memory problem rather than a learning problem. And uh, another possibility is that testing occurs when the status of US was degraded. And I don't have time to explain how that kind of thing works. But the general conclusion is that the implication of uh, common diagrams for Pavlovian conditioning, which suggests that the experiment is a failure if you don't have a reaction to the CS. That implication is really not valid. Pavlovian conditioning is a lot more complicated than that. Anyway, I hope uh, this will uh, encourage you <laughs> to persevere in your study of Pavlovian conditioning, even if you don't see a, a direct uh, response to the CS. Thanks very much for your attention and uh, see you next time.